Right, now, uh, this is the uh, first in a series of meetings which Duncan Hallis, I'm sure, needs no introduction, uh, is doing. Duncan is uh, a long-time member of the uh, SWP Central Committee. And it's the first of, uh, of the meeting on the basic principles of Marxism. Uh, this meeting is on historical materialism, and Duncan's going to speak for about 40 minutes. Okay, I'll hand over now to Duncan. Comrades, the foundation, the basis of Marx's approach to society is something called historical materialism. I should tell you, to be honest, that Marx himself did not use that word. Uh, it was invented by Engels, but never mind. What is it all about? Now, in essence, it is very simple. But simple is not the same thing as easy, as we shall see. The simplest things are often the hardest to grasp. We'll start with the historical thing. Why bother? After all, what has happened has happened, and nothing we do now can alter what has happened in the past. Why bother? And of course, there was an influential school, influential in Britain at any rate, in the period of high reaction, the early Cold War period, about the late 40s, early 50s, and so on, when professors of history, well paid in places like Oxford and so on, were writing articles and were on the radio and, say, and so on and so forth, saying there is nothing to be learned from history. The obvious response was, well, why do you pay your salary? I mean, why, <laughs> why devote real resources? Why not tidbits or motorcycle neighbors, which is at least useful? <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> it was the biology at the time. Uh, ah, another bourgeois historian uh, wrote, this kind of attitude occurs periodically, and it is always the impression of a ruling class which has lost its confidence. All right! Under the umbrella of American power, British ruling class recovered its confidence. Consequently, we don't have the most notorious uh, advocate of the man that there is nothing to be, uh, the view, there's nothing to be learned from history, with a man called Professor Butterfield. We don't have the Butterfields anymore. They are replaced by other kinds of bourgeois historians. The point is, however, that it is in possible to understand the world today without seeing how it has become as it is. It is impossible. Now, of course, there are various degrees of importance. It is not really, I suppose, of any great interest uh, today. The fact that uh, Queen Anne was sterile, apparently. At least she was unable to produce uh, viable offspring, is there? trivial matter, it has its causes, medical causes, no doubt, it is trivial. But the fact that there was a revolution in this country in the 17th century is not trivial, because it shaped what subsequently happened. All right, so much for the history. Now, I'm not going to uh, give a great deal of detail about the past. I'm going to give some, though, because to talk about the theory without talking about what the theory is about is a nonsense. Let us move to the materialism thing. Now this I shall deal with very briefly and brutally, I suppose, in the eyes of people who believe that there is something called philosophy, which is today useful and so on and so forth. The basic notion of materialism is simply this. The world, the universe, exists independently of our consciousness. That is the central notion. It is independent of our consciousness, one, and two, we understand it insofar as we do understand it only by interaction with it. That is to say, even perception is an active, everyday perception is an active process. Now that's the essence of what Marx meant by his kind of materialism. All we need to know about it really is that world outside us. Well, this world outside us, we interact with. The universe outside us, we interact with in varying degrees. And it is not to be changed simply by an act of will, but only by understanding it. In other words, the scientific method. Everything else, therefore, is irrelevant from this point of view. 
all kinds of superstition, mysticisms, and so on have to be explained. They have causes, but they do not advance our knowledge at all. All right, so now it comes to the basic notion which dawned on the young Marx in the 1840s. Never mind the circumstances, he was surrounded, he grew up in an atmosphere, the Germany of the 1830s and 40s, still dominated by the reaction of the ideas, uh, the settlement of 1815, never mind what that was, except to say that it preserved the old regime in Europe for several decades beyond its natural death. Ideas which were essentially concerned with the notion of what's in our heads the most important thing in life. That's the most important thing. Marx, at an early stage, rejected that, and more important, came to this basic notion, which, as I say, is very simple, although simple, I repeat, is not the same thing as simple. He said three things. First of all, what people actually do is what determines what they really are. What they do, not what they say about it, or they think about it, but what they do is what determines what they are in reality. Secondly, the most important thing that any of us, unless we belong to highly privileged classes, ever do in our entire lives is obtain the wherewithal to live. The material and other wherewithal to live. In other words, the basic notion that it is how people collectively produce what they consume that matters, that that shapes the whole form of society, any given society. It is shaped by the way in which things are made, things are produced, and so on and so forth. And thirdly, very important, the ideas in our heads are not a simple reflection of these things, far from it, they relate to previous ideas, to all sorts of things, but they are themselves shaped by the nature of the productive process. Now then, very simple, really, very simple ideas, but to grasp their implications is not at all simple. Let us therefore look at a little <coughs> actual history or prehistory. History, as such, depends on written records. There are no written records for 99% plus of the existence of uh, our kind, humankind in general. I know there are people who dispute this and we want to reduce the period. I'll leave that aside. The fact of the matter is that history, as we know it, is a product of particular kinds of societies. Societies in which there were people who earned their bread, so to say, uh, by writing. Uh, now then, uh, you don't eat writing. Uh, somebody else must provide the food, the clothing, etc., etc., for this to be possible. Uh, particularly in the early stages, by the way, it's a difficult, complicated process. In other words, history, in the narrow sense, is a product of class society. But as I say, class societies are a relatively recent phenomenon. Broadly speaking, and I, I don't want to argue about dates, I'm willing to shift half a million years one way or the other. The <laughs> fact is, for at least more than a million years, there have been human societies. How did heaven do we know that? Since they left no written record. We know simply because, and this is Marx's definition, really the Marxist definition of a human society, they were cultural tool makers. That is to say, they produced, and we can find the things of, actually good specimens, the equipment or elements of the equipment that they made and used, but made according to standard patterns. In other words, <coughs> From that we can infer something about the way they lived. And good, the way they lived for the better part, most of a million years, or more perhaps, was by hunting and gathering. Leave aside the different stages in this. You know, Engels has an elaborate scheme in the origins of the family. That scheme will not do. Oh, not a wrong thing in the light of the knowledge that then existed, but he will not do. Forget it. What we can say with certainty is that for most of the existence 
Our species are a similar species in seeking earth, hunting and gathering. <coughs> now in that period, incidentally, very important things happened, which we do know about, I'll come back to that at the end. Then there was, about 10,000 years ago, a fundamental development. The discovery, no doubt, a slow, gradual, <coughs> irregular process of cultivation. Cultivation of grasses in the first instance, the wild ancestors of wheat and barley and other grains and so on, plus other grains. <coughs> and at about the same time, about the same time, I don't want to into arguments in detail, the discovery that you can domesticate animals. Now, strictly speaking, one at least has been domesticated before, or half domesticated, the dog, our oldest domestic animal. But domesticated animals from which you can get meat and milk and later wool, etc., etc. Now then, when I say this was a fundamental change, I will argue it was one of the two really fundamental changes that has occurred since, you know, the evolution of our species. How do we know this? Is it simply a subjective idea? Because I think so, or somebody else thinks so. No, 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 no. We have objective evidence. And that objective evidence relates to population. You know, there are no census figures, no censuses. The whole notion of a census implies a state, taxation, and so on. The censuses are carried out in tax in the first instance. Uh, it is probable, however, that 10,000 years ago, the entire population of the planet was less than the population of Greater London today, and perhaps substantially less, who knows? Therefore you can put forward all sorts of theories, but it was very thin on the ground. About that there is no doubt at all. Between about 10,000 years ago, say 8,000 BC, give or take a bit, you know, depending on how they rejig the dating or somebody discovers something new, but broadly speaking, the world's population exploded. This was the first real population explosion. We know that in the course of a few thousand years, agriculture spread from original centers in the Middle East not to say they were the only original centers, but they were the ones that mattered in this period. As far east of India, Turkestan, and so on, and by six and a half thousand years ago, even to the western fringes, even to Britain. And that the people were vastly more numerous. I mean, it's a very striking phrase, uh, dead archaeologists. Uh, not a Marxist, by the way, it's not child, made about this. They're so, talking about Britain specifically. So, that, you know, if you had together all the remains, all the artifacts, I love the bones, I the end bones, for the immense period of time before the introduction of agriculture, you can put them in one small room. But from once agriculture was introduced, it was introduced by immigrants, by the way, the population exploded. We know this because the remains are common. A population explosion, right? One, that's one objective fact. Two, second objective fact, very, very important. At about the same time, now when I say about, again, a thousand years this way or that, I'm entirely prepared to concede, nobody knows with any accuracy, but around the same time, a whole complex of inventions was developed by unknown illiterate people. Spinning, weaving, pottery, all those three, or at least the first and last, by the way, certainly the achievement of women. I will go into the argument if anyone is interested. Uh, but not only that, a whole series of other artifacts and so on, which were very, very, still are important, which were very important until quite recently. And of course, ideological uh, features. Which actually, from these primitive barbarians, survived in modified form in class societies. For example, you know, as uh, they used to tell us, they don't anymore, this is a Christian country. Hmm? Well, this is me here, but they used to tell us that. And it's still taught in schools, indeed, under this reaction of his government. Uh, everyone's got to learn this sort of stuff. The notion of a dead and risen saviour was certainly created by early agricultural people. No question about it. They observed 
plant dies, grasses remember, proto wheat, proto barley, you take the seeds, you sow them in the ground, they sowed other things in the ground less pleasant because they thought you had to have people involved too. And then comes the spring, it comes again, it arises so to say from the dead, and then it dies and so on, there is a cycle, dead and risen and dead and risen and so on complex of ideas which actually in modified form constituted an important element in the ideology of most western societies until quite recently the product of illiterate barbarians using the term in its technical sense you know as uh, marxists did in the 19th century as bourgeois things and then there's a third change less fundamental in some ways or rather more drawn out because you see, if we uh, ask ourselves, what do we know about early agricultural societies? Well, quite a lot compared with societies previously. Well, we don't know anything in detail about names and places and so on. One thing we can say with confidence, <coughs> a change which in a certain sense is more important than any of the specific discoveries was the fact that agriculturalists produce a surplus. Hunter-gatherer societies do not. Uh, there is a lovely story uh, in my well, reactionary fellow he is, I think he's still alive or died quite recently, <coughs> a man called Andrew Post, South African, who uh, early in the early years of this century, before their society had been completely disintegrated, observed and lived with uh, uh, Khoisan people, Bushmen, etc., in what is now Southwest Africa. And he, his descriptions are actually brilliant, it's well worth reading. Uh, they live for the present. They live for the present. There is no future, there is no end, so on and so forth. Typically, they live, by our standards, at a very low material level. Occasionally, however, they have a find, a find. They have an achievement. There is his description of killing an elephant. There were still elephants. And it's very interesting from a number of points of view, but never mind the description. What is used is a wooden instrument, a long wooden spear, which is sharpened by, they're still using stone tools, although they were getting bits of glass and metal from the more advanced peoples around them, and you harden it in the back. <laughs> they track the beast, they go for an old beast, of course, they know they have no chance against the herd and so on, an isolated beast. They track it for a long time. Their perception is tracks and all the rest are much better than ours. Not because there's anything physically superior about them, because their life depended on it. And then a group of men, five or six, he says, he also can able to count between five and six, <laughs> never <mind. laughs> At one moment, rush up to this beast, all on the spear, rush up and drive it into its side, and then run away like hell. <laughs> the, uh, the animal doesn't die. Again, we shouldn't idealise such societies. It took several days for it to die, please, to death over time. And then there is plenty. In fact, there is embarrassing plenty. Tiny groups, small population come from miles around to feast on this beast as it rots away. They must have liked high meat and like out of a plastic. Point is, <laughs> they gorge themselves until they can't eat anymore. And then that's it. They do not accumulate. They have no refrigerators, etc., etc. Then we go through a period, perhaps, of dearth, when there is very little game, and we are reduced to eating nuts or rock, damn it, whatever, roots and so on and so forth. Point is, you, such societies do not produce a surplus, which has two consequences. First of all, there cannot be social classes. It is impossible for there to be full-time specialists who earn their living by doing what I am doing and talking at the moment, or by working magic, or by saying I'm a great warrior, etc., etc., all must participate. There can be no classes. There's a sexual division of labor, yes, but there are no classes. These societies are classless. Without a surplus, there cannot be class society. Then, of course, you move to agricultural societies, ask yourself simple question. Where does the seed come from? The seed comes from the previous crop. Actually, we know archaeologically how this was done. Pits were dug, baskets 
basket three and so on. Either develop, you dump them in for the year, and then you can sow again next year. Similarly, with the sheep, goats, sheep, amongst the earliest of domesticated animals, you have this herd, you coddle it with dogs and so on and so forth. And they reproduce it, you kill some, you keep others, and so on and so forth. Now then, there is something produced over and above what is necessary to fill the belly today. That has enormous consequences because it is at any rate possible, although it does not necessarily happen, for there to be what the bourgeois anthropologists are pleased to call a degree of specialization. Which means that we have, to quote uh, uh, Biblical English, which is really very expressive, you can have people who toil not, neither do they spin but actually manage to live very well. You have the possibility, not the necessity, but you have the possibility. You have other possibilities, less desirable. One thing about, uh, anyway, no thing about uh, Northern British and Southern Scottish history, no. One thing about both grain and sheep is that they can be lifted. That is to say, as opposed to doing the work, it is possible to take it from someone who has. It is possible. It doesn't necessarily happen, but it is possible. This is not possible with hunter-gatherers. You can't steal anything from them, because in truth they have nothing to steal, nothing worth stealing. With cultivation you can. So you have a combination, a population explosion. And I mean a population explosion. Over the course of a few thousand years, the world's population increased massively. Massively, something that wasn't to happen again until the period from the late 18th century to the present. Secondly, you have a way of life, a way of earning many, if you like, although that's too narrow a way of putting it, which opens up other possibilities. These possibilities include the development of social classes. Now, the actual process whereby this happened is obscure. Nevertheless, <laughs> Now, I don't want to waste time talking about theories. The fact is, it happened. Particularly, it happened in some areas where the potential gains from taming a very difficult environment are enormous. Okay. Uh, it's probably fairly familiar to many people, but still. Because they kept record, records of this sort, we know something about the yields, the actual yields, that were achieved by early civilized society. Civilized meant flight in cities, by the way. Cities are small thing. Most people work outside on the land, in Mesopotamia, in southern Iran. Uh, a very difficult environment. When the pioneers went there, they were already cultivators, it was jungle. Swamp, jungle, and so on. They tamed it, they developed irrigation. And the rewards were enormous. We know their yields, you know, you count the yields, they grew mostly barley, in terms of how many grains do you sow, how many grains do you get? Well, they were getting, by about two and a half thousand BC, yields of 300 to 1. That is vastly higher than was obtained in Europe, anywhere in Europe, until the present century. Enormous! The surplus is no longer just a surplus, the surplus is tremendous. Secondly, the task of mastering the environment gives rise to specialists who can be easily supported. These specialists, when the first written records appear, are already established. You see, there are priests, kings, etc., etc. You have a class society. A class is the same thing happened in Egypt, although the, re the records are not so satisfactory, and in a number of other places. Now then, once you have made this jump, you have made another fundamental change. Whatever its precursors amongst, you know, barbarian cultivators, the fact is there is a real and qualitative jump <coughs> because the full-time specialists becoming the ruling class, classes developing distinct social classes, also create other classes. They employ other full-time specialists, metal workers, which has developed extensively at this time, full-time metal workers. They don't plow, they don't sow, etc. No, no, no. You've got a hierarchy developing and corresponding ideological changes which I will talk about. Now then, 
This happened at least twice in different places. The other being Central and part of South America. <coughs> Maybe it happened more, but once it had happened, something fundamentally affects everyone else. It is called uneven and combined development. You see, these people, early civilized society, can conscript a workforce, can organize an army, or rather their rulers can as opposed to, you know, the casual, uh, tribal, flashy people can conquer one another and can conquer the su surrounding barbarians. The surrounding <coughs> barbarians learn the techniques and they too think, aha, we can take over the operation. In other words, war as an institution. One of the most, most of the actual information, as a matter of fact, we have about early civilized societies is about two things. Grain yields on the one hand and war on the other. I mean, most of the real information, all the ideological right stuff about this god, that god, and so on and so forth, that's just, that's just a reflection. No, no, these two things. And consequently, the area of civilization, life in cities, class society, begins to expand, and did expand. All right, technological developments also took place. The world was changed, and yet, it was still true of all these societies that big surplus, yes, relative to what had gone before. But at the end of the day, if we distribute it equally, the so-and-sos will eat it. I mean, broadly speaking, the surplus will disappear and there will be no pyramids. So what, you might say? No great loss. There will be no irrigation works on a large scale. That's a much more serious problem, etc., etc. What I am saying is, Class society becomes a possibility when, in certain circumstances, the productivity of labor rises very considerably, but it also becomes a necessity for progress. Now, that's a horrible thing to say. Exploitation, oppression, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, a necessary cost of progress. Now then, how do these societies change? Class society. From now on, and from now, means crop. About 3, 2000 BC. What happens in the areas of civilization is what is important to the world. Now again, come on. You look at these things in a moralistic point of view. From a moralistic point of view, sounds a horrible thing to say. Yes, but you see, they were the future. They were the future, and what's more, a necessary future. There is no way in which you can avoid this stage. How do these societies then themselves change? Let us go back to dear old Marx, uh, writing in 1847, the Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing society, and he meant class society, is the history of class struggle. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, stood in constant opposition to one another, now hidden, now open, in a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Now then, fundamental statement, the dynamic of change, the dynamic of progress in a class society is the class struggle, is the class struggle. Not true. Manifestly, it can't be true of pre-class society, but class societies, that's the argument. Now let's see what is being said and what is not being said. The first thing, of course, is that a typical class society does not consist of people at the top, people in the middle, and people below, all revolting, conscious, and so on and so forth, fighting it out. A society in that state of affairs is close to dissolution, isn't it? Therefore, most of the time, most of the time, the struggle is, as Marx said, hidden. Nevertheless, it conditions everything that happens. The class struggle is the dynamic of change in a class society. Secondly, the class struggle, however, does not occur in a vacuum. It is not the case that uh, you know, nothing changes. On the contrary, we have to consider the role of the techniques of production. 
<laughs> it's a technology to use the modern jar. Now then, if we look back, we can see that as a matter of fact, techniques of production have been progressively changed over a long period. Slowly at first, then faster, then faster, and now it's a fantastic, a sensational rate. How does this happen? It's important to address this question because there are people who think that the development of technology is somehow autonomous of society and determines what happens. For example, it is sometimes said, and even Engels actually lent himself to this at one stage in part, you know, you look at feudal society in Europe, what brought it down, I am quoting and vulgarizing, to be fair to the man, a well-known American historian, three things, he says, uh, gunpowder, the compass, what you stood to? Oh, the printing press. These are the things that brought down feudal society, yes? Now, we have to say, it's understandable. It is understandable that this view should have been taken, but it is a mistaken view. Because, you see, although it is true <coughs> that the cumulative effect of technological change is, as Marx himself said, to modify the relations of production and therefore to undermine an existing society, these things have to be taken up. And whether they are taken up or not depends not on the ingenuity of Bloggs or Smith, although such things are essential, but whether they fit the interests of at least some sections of the privileged classes, whether they can use them. Uh, I don't want, perhaps I shouldn't digress about this because I haven't time, but I will, I will give you uh, one small illustration of this point. Um, the Mediterranean world, around 2000 to, what, 1700 or so years ago, uh, was dominated by one state, a slave empire, the Roman Empire. Basic mode of production was slavery, which does not mean, by the way, that most people were slaves. We'll talk about that when I talk about capitalism. Uh, now then, this was also a highly cultivated society, as far as its ruling classes were concerned, for part of the time anyway, and certainly the intermediate layers. A whole variety of technical innovations what were produced by various people, including even a toy steam engine, didn't affect the structure of society significantly. The only innovations that were taken up were those of an architectural and military engineering type. Why? Why? Because in a slave society, there is no motive to economize, no drive, no external drive to jack up the productivity of labor. And not only that, to do so is to uh, weaken the framework of society. Gibbon, in his history, tells the story of a Roman emperor called Vespasian, a usurper, but obviously a man of considerable common sense, who was brought an invention by, this is for supplying Rome with water, <coughs> chain circulating uh, buckets and so on and so forth, elaborate thing driven by animal power. And the emperor looked at it and said, yes, very good, and gave him 50,000 sesterces. I don't know how much a sesterce was. Does anyone know? Anyway, gave him some money and said, no, we don't take it up. Because he said, what will happen to the poor people who do the work? In other words, now, all right, maybe he was a bit of a humanitarian, although the rest of his record doesn't suggest that. The point is, the point is, that you see the thing is actually potentially disruptive in that kind of society. Now you ask yourself, why then, later, European feudalism, were innovations taken up, windmill, water wheel, wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow, you know, you only need to go back 50 years to see how important wheelbarrows are, you know, in terms of minimizing human labor. Now it's all done on conveyor. They were taken up because of a different social structure. They were taken up, feudal structure, highly decentralized, with diverse interests amongst the ruling classes. That is why. Not someone invented gunpowder. For God's sake, the Chinese have had it for several centuries before it came to Europe. Didn't do much with it except make fireworks. Again, you ask yourself why? Because they're stupid. Don't be silly. No, no. Because the social framework was such that the innovation is not readily taken up. European feudalism, innovations were taken up. And this is related to the nature of the class struggle and the social structure. Far from it being the case that European feudalism was brought down by gunpowder, the compass, and the printing press, the other way down, 
gunpowder, the use of gunpowder, not the invention, the printing press was also borrowed from the Chinese, by the way, and the compass, which as it happens was also borrowed from these back and staggering Chinese, were made important by what? By European feudalism, by sections of the feudal ruling classes in their own interests, and then produced social modifications which did in the end, oh God, it was a long, slow and painful process, bring down the feudal system. Uh, in other words, it is not technology, but people. And not people as individuals, but social classes that produce uh, social change. Now then, we must now look at something quite different, which is very important. You know, back to the Bible. Man does not live by bread alone. And that has always been true, even before bread was invented. <laughs> Man had to be invented, again, invented by illiterate barbarians of whom we know nothing, cultivators. Uh, you see, we live in a world which exists independently of us in reality. But that is not our immediate perception. We have something called consciousness. We have a set of ideas, explanations. Now these ideas need not have any great connection with reality. I'll explain the limitations of that at the moment, but they exist. We live in a mental world, not just a, a physical environment. <laughs> and uh, therefore, the question of ideas and what Marx called ideology. A word of explanation. The term ideology, lots of terms are used in different senses. The term ideology is used by modern bourgeois commentators to mean a set of ideas that we don't like. Hmm? They have ideology, we don't. Yeah? No, no. For Marx, it was more specific. Ideology, Marx is a more or less systematic set of ideas related to one another. I mean, some people relate them better than others. But which is in some sense systematically false, or as he said, a kind of false consciousness. Now, wait a minute, there have to be limits on this. You know, the outside world keeps coming and hitting us on the head or kicking us in the butt. There must be ways of explaining this. Therefore, any long-lasting and influential ideology, Christianity, Islam, etc., must have some connection with people's perception of the actual reality. Uh, nevertheless, ideology, <coughs> dominant, <coughs> inevitably dominant, in class society. And before we look at the question of ideology and class, it would be useful to see how this false consciousness derives. Now, pottery, on a large scale anyway, was a product of the Neolithic Revolution, the development of agriculture and so on. I know it's right so just to forestall objections. There is good evidence that some hunter-gatherers, particularly in Japan, developed pots because they depended largely on fishing. Leave that aside as a big-scale phenomenon it's a product of agriculture, it's a product of women, uh, actually the sexual division of labour and so on. Now there is something, pots are not important to it now, we live in a world of plastic, yeah? I mean, you, again, when you're going to go back 40 or so years, they're much more important. Pots, containers, which you can shape according to your requirements. This is an enormous achievement, it doesn't seem like magic, and it did. There's a problem with it though, you make these things painfully, originally, you know, children do, you rub the uh, plasticine or what have you in the clay and you coil it round and so on and you shape it and you put it and so on and then you have to fire it. Now unfortunately, in the firing process, sometimes they crack, something goes wrong. And hence, these people are very innovative. So there's a reason for this. What is the reason? It is some malevolent spirit. It is a demon. And consequently, masks were made. We still have them. You see them in museums to protect the kiln from, to frighten away, you know, to frighten away the malevolent spirit so that the pots didn't crack. That's ideology. Because as we know, the real reason that uh, pots crack has to do with temperature control and so on and so forth. <laughs> Nevertheless, let me make this point. Actually, the people who conceived this idea were, had grasped one important notion. Things have a cause. They did not simply say, pots crack, it's in the nature of pots. Human nature, <laughs> that's human nature. <laughs> Explanations of that kind are both useless and reactionary, but especially useless because they do not lead to any remedial action. 
Now the specific, our search for remedial action, the specific remedial action that they hit upon was not in truth very effective. Although since it was done for thousands of years, people must have thought it was so. That's ideology at the most basic level. Right? But you see in a class society, <coughs> ideology assumes a series of different functions. It is not the case that you're trying to explain a mysterious world. Why did the pot crack? Why did the cow die? Someone put a spell on the cow, etc., etc. It is not simply that, it is the interest of classes. And we can look at this in a developed form by looking at feudal Europe. Again, very elementary and deliberately choosing elementary and well known examples. You see, in the social theory of the high Middle Ages, there are three sorts of people. There are fighters, there are prayers to propitiate the deity, and there are cultivators who do the work, as we would say. But of course it's all work. It's all essential. Uh, without the fighters, highly privileged class, the nobility, where would we be? Answer, much better off. But that is not the answer <laughs> given by the society. Without the people praying and saying masses three times a day for my soul, my soul would roast in hell or purgatory or what have you. Actually, it wouldn't worry me very much, but that's not the answer given at the time. You see, you had a, the, in the theory, in truth, the class structure was more complex than this. That is the theory. Now then, it can be elaborated. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the wealthiest uh, bishop in England living inside the Archbishop of Canterbury, a man called, uh, an office called the Bishopric of Winchester, which stretched actually right up to the south of the Thames around here, to Southwark. And in Southwark there were maintained by the Bishop's office, as I don't mean to say he did the job himself, uh, what were called in Shakespearean languages, language, the Bishop's stews, i.e. brothels. Come, come, how can we possibly, how can the church do it? don't understand. Given man's simple nature, immorality is inevitable. And therefore it is better that it should be organized and conducted by those who aspire to higher things than left to mere villains. It's what's nowadays called the dented shield. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have I assure you, the whole ideology, you see, in reality, this is done because it brings profit to the bishop and his officers. But the ideological explanations, of course, are elaborated. Now we come to a fundamentally important point. Not why the bishop convinces himself that it is necessary to screw the, his serfs for every little last promise where he can get out of them, etc., etc., or ensure the maximum return on his brothels and his other enterprises. No, no. Why do the mass of the people accept this in however distorted a form? Marx's fundamental contribution to the notion of why religious belief and other ideological beliefs come from below as well as from below. Above. They're not simply imposed. The whole notion of alienation, exploitation. Exploitation is obvious. Alienation arises because the very conditions that oppress people are produced by the labor of those people themselves. But it is not perceived in this sense, it is perceived in another way. You know, hence the power of ideologies originating in the ruling classes, yes, partly believed in by the ruling classes, by the way. It would be a great mistake to suppose that all countries hypocrites but believed in by the mass of believers, you know. Marx's famous thing about religion, hope of a hopeless world, 